John, John, you there? No, John. Here we go. Colin Coward in for John Oran next on the Marsh and Oran Sports Media Podcast. And we're back. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. And he's Colin Coward, FS1 personality in the herd, iHeartRadio, the volume. He's in for John Oran. It's kind of a big get slash fill in move uh, here and <laughs> pretty big uh, for you, Colin, to fill in for John Oran uh, after, you know, ESPN, FS1, the volume. And now filling in for Oran has to be, it has to be a big a highlight. A lot of pressure. Career. I'm not sure pressure. if I'm up to it. Yeah. All right. Uh, we always go who's up, who's down. Who's up, who's down. Colin, let me start. My who's up is Mike Breen. And the reason is sometimes someone's really good for a long time. and We kind of overlook them a little bit. And when I look at Mike Breen, he's approaching now his 100th game uh, of doing the NBA finals, which is amazing. I mean, that is way more than anybody. You know, we always associate Marv Albert uh, with the NBA. And to me, Marv's the best ever. Uh, but Breen, he's excellent. He were, he succeeded Marv in New York doing the Knicks. Uh, and he's become the voice of the NBA finals. You know, he does have his signature call with bang. But what really separates Breen and what why he's been able to now hold that position for so long is he's consistent. If there's big calls, he's on it. Uh, he doesn't try to be too flashy. Three-man booth is hard uh, to do in basketball. But with Jeff Van Gundy, who I think might be the best game analyst uh, in TV sports, uh, and Mark Jackson, they have a good thing going. All right, who do you got? Who's up? Well, I will say New York has a great history, um, whether it's Marty Glickman, Marv Albert, Mike Breen. I was texting Breen yesterday. I think Mike's the best. Um that's arguably ever done it. And I love Marv Albert, um, college announcers, basketball in New York. Um, I know it's considered a baseball city, but New York has such a great history on basketball and broadcasters. Um, my up is Greg Olson. Now I know he works for Fox sports, but I interviewed Greg when he was a player. I, he just won an Emmy. Greg is really unique in that, um, you know, a lot of people in the media, you know, they have to kind of wag their intellect over your head and bang it like a hammer. Uh, Greg makes me really smart, and he does it organically, authentically. He can make a swing pass to Christian McCaffrey because he's such a current player. Uh, the language, his description of it, I feel like there'll be three or four times every broadcast with Greg Olson that I'm like, I've been watching football 40 years. I had no idea. Uh, so I, I think he does a terrific job and he's also a, he's a good teammate. He's a good guy. And I don't know how much validity I give the Emmys. I've seen people win those and I roll my eyes at it, but uh, I'm really happy for Greg. Yeah. The quick thing on the Emmys, I used to sometimes go to the Emmys and predict uh, who was going to win. And I'd predict by who I thought was least deserving. And that's who I choose because I, no offense to the Emmys. They're very nice hosts. I was there two weeks ago. Uh, it's nice. Everyone likes winning them. Uh, like I say about awards all the time, they don't mean anything and they're stupid unless you win it. Uh, then then everyone <laughs> likes them. So, all right, my who's down. going to go into your territory, L.A. Uh, and it's going to be, though, the commissioner, Gary Bettman, the reason the L.A. Kings situation. Uh, first off, Alex Faust a young up-and-coming TV play-by-player. -player. He's out this week because they're going to combine their broadcast of TV and radio. Uh, so Faust, uh, young guy, kind of, you know, in that brethren we were talking about. Uh, and he's doing well. He's doing Apple TV, and he'll find other jobs. He'll be fine. Uh, but they don't have a TV deal going to next year. And this has been a big topic uh, for our podcast, you know, for where this is the 90th episode in terms of the regional sports network we've been talking about for a long time. And the Kings, they don't have a deal. And that that's a problem for Gary Bettman. It's a problem for Adam Silver. It's a problem for Rob Manfred. Uh, how do you figure out this regional sports network situation? And in a market like LA, and I know the Kings, they draw well. I don't think they're as popular. You know, it's a core audience, which is always how hockey is. But to not have that distribution and not be able to be seen um, right now at all, I mean, I'm sure they'll figure out something, uh, is a major, major issue uh, in terms of growing your sport and sustaining your sport because people have to be able to see your games. 
Uh, similarly, my who's down uh, is Major League Baseball, and I don't know who to blame. But there's an old saying in sports that the NBA thinks of it first, football gets it right, and baseball makes the most money off it. And a couple of weeks ago, and I've heard friends who are baseball fans say this, they can't find the games. A couple of weeks ago, the Yankees over a five-game series were on four different platforms. Uh, you know, one of them Apple TV, one of them local, one of them national. I talked about this years ago. I think it was with Bill Simmons about my reluctance to ever put anything behind a paywall. Maybe if you're Oprah or Howard Stern, the harder you make it for people to find your content, they will go away. Um, there, It's very rare when you ever see in the history of broadcasters, you can do a Howard Stern and go from FM radio to XM. You better not make a third move. Baseball is increasingly hard to find. Uh, and for a brand like the Yankees, um, it, it, you can't make it that difficult. These these seasons already lack urgency. You know, in the NFL, you're just going to go find your game. There's one a week. Baseball is begging you to do other things. And so I don't know who to blame on that. But I think baseball, listen, you're making enough money. Make it easier to find your team's games. Yeah, I think what happened there, too, is, you know, they did their ESPN deal. They re up there and ESPN actually is paying MLB a little less money than they were previously. They're doing less games. And so they want to make up for the that that number. Uh, and Apple is paying somewhere around eighty five million dollars. And there's some ad buys there. Uh, and then Peacock's deals for much less than that for Sunday uh, morning baseball. And. Yeah, I think when you're just chasing money, it's a, it's a difficult equation, right? Because they want to make up that money in the interim. Uh, but And then you do have to see the streaming work. Uh, but like you're saying, uh, that was a big issue here in New York uh, because you went Wednesday, you had Amazon. Then Thursday, it was Yes. Then Friday, it was Apple. And then Saturday, it might have been Yes again. could have been Fox. And then Sunday morning, it was Peacock. Uh, and that is just that is a lot to try to figure out. And I think your big point is maybe we'll get into this a little bit later. The regular seasons of these sports are not that important um, overall in terms of the NFL. It's every week. There's only 17 games uh, and each week is important. And it's only a three hour commitment. When you're asking for a huge commitment, you need consistency where to find it. And that has become an issue. And also, I think the other issue is, and this is unreported because we don't know the exact numbers. And I think Amazon with the Yankees does OK uh, because the Yankees and it's Amazon and it's consistent. Uh, it's usually on Wednesdays and there's 20 games. So there's value for customers. Uh, but I don't think people are watching the Apple games and I don't know the Peacock numbers, but I have a pretty good suspicion. There are probably not huge numbers there either. Uh, and so that's a huge problem because you're making your audience smaller. And I understand, um, you know, sports is the only thing on linear TV now that even gets a number outside of occasional election nights. Yep. So I understand it. I mean, we saw it with the live tour and the PGA money talks. I mean, in, in, in the end, that's why they made the deal because huge sponsored and huge sponsors. Alan Shipnuck told me today, Two major sponsors pulled out of the PGA. Live couldn't get a TV contract. So in the end, it came down to money for both. And I, I get it, but baseball has never been short on cash. It is the sport because of the volume of the games. I, I just feel like it would be okay occasionally, and maybe I'm naive. Just make your stuff accessible to people. I mean, for baseball fans also, Andrew, many are over 60. Trying to get my mom to change the channel. Yep. I mean, I see the podcast audience. You get over 60, you lose people. Baseball's core audience is older. Don't make them search on multiple platforms and download multiple apps. Because you touched on live and, um, you know, this week, this is the biggest story in sports. Uh, and it was a shocker uh, when the news came. Uh, they obviously had it set up for CNBC to break the story. And then they had an interview with the PGA commissioner, Jay Monahan, and then uh, people from uh, the Saudi group as well. Uh, so they had that interview all set up and they announced it. The players don't know uh, about it. Um, there's media implications. Uh, you had some very good reactions and you even talked about 
being offered uh, to to work with Live Golf over the past, you know, since they started. Uh, and this is what you had to say. Here's a, here's a snippet of it. I don't have to love the Live Golf Tour and everything it stands for. By the way, I was offered six figures to do some reads for the Live Golf Tour. I didn't accept it. But, but, I didn't badmouth other hosts that did. Okay, I liked what you said there because, you, you yes, you made a decision not to, to take the six-figure offer from Live Golf, but you don't know what other people's, what goes into their decision-making. And I thought that was important, so you don't know about everything. However, um, when I look at this Live Golf deal and I look at Jay Monahan. Um, and it's still developing as we speak. And when this comes out, you know, more stuff will be, there'll be more information, but I just can't understand. And this is where I kind of think there's judgment is how they use the nine 11 families to say that live golf was bad. And then now you're in business with live golf. Right. I just don't know. I get it. I'm sure there's so much money involved and I'm sure everyone's going to get paid and it's going to be great in terms of their wealth. I just would have trouble looking myself in the mirror if I did that and I said those well, things and why would you say those things if you think this could be an outcome? And that's the key. I thought that was sanctimonious. I thought using the 9-11 families was over the top. Um, listen, when I was offered a situation where there was a, a six figure offer to one of my shows and I would have been paid because I have a revenue share with a couple different people. And my takeaway was, um, I had known people um, with a connection to 9-11. I lived out East for 10 years. And I was just like, God, if they knew I took money from this, how would they think of me? Uh, and so I decided I, I just wasn't comfortable with it. Now, if it would have been 10000000 million, I'd have probably taken it. $20 million, $30 million. So I didn't want to judge because I knew I felt bad about it, but we all have a price, right? Okay. So I thought, it would be okay to criticize the golfers for leaving the tour and saying, you know what? We're a pretty darn good platform for you. <laughs> you know, we set up these great tournaments that have historical precedent with ratings. We put you in these tournaments. We market you. That was the play. Not how dare you're leaving us yeah. or you lack moral fortitude, almost sympathetically, your family, you're leaving us. That was a stronger argument to me. But I think, you know, you ever see on Twitter, somebody's really vile, and then you go to their account, and it's like, follower of Christ. I don't mind people being argumentative or following Jesus. Don't be vile and have that as the lead part of your bio. Is I thought the PGA played it wrong. There was a way to play it which is your family. We've supported you. This breaks our heart. Not judging people, judging people's morals or values. So what happens is you get backed into a corner when you do that, <laughs> because we all know something to be true, is that stars drive everything. If Tom Cruise was only available on Hulu, I would watch more Hulu. I like the Mission Impossible series. If Matt Damon was only available on Paramount, I would watch more Paramount. I like Matt Damon. Like, I'm going to follow sure. Brooks Kepka. You know, and the other thing is if Tiger was still a dominant force, they may not merge. But Alan Shipnut told me today, some of this was they were losing sponsors. And Brooks Kepka is, to, and to me, I'm a casual. I watch the majors. Brooks Kepka, Dustin Johnson, Andrew, they get me to a TV. Yes, and there's a media component of this is that, it worked, though, um, in terms of, I mean, obviously, you know, this isn't the show to get into what the Saudis, you know, and getting into the politics and everything. That's not what we're going to do here. But there is a connection to 9-11. Um, there is uh, Jamal Khashoggi, who was killed and which, you know, our government has said it was the Saudis who did that um, from the top. So those are legitimate things. But the. If the live if live golf was not with tied with the Saudi money, they would have gotten a better TV deal. They would have been able to get maybe Fox. They, they it's it's I don't think it's really in question. They had to go to the CW because nobody else would do a deal with them, and so they they did they did that. So so it partly worked what they were doing. It just wasn't a plan. 
because if you look, you always have to evaluate what the situation is. And at the end of the day, they have more money. And they didn't really, there wasn't really for them, as far as anybody could tell who, who really studies this and who's in media, there's no real, there wasn't really a money making situation here when you start paying Phil 200 and you're offering Tiger or whatever it was, 750, 850 uh, million. That's not really a plan in terms of being able to get that money back, at least in the short term, maybe long term. To me, the question is, and if I'm a reporter out there who covers this, I'm asking myself, what are they hiding? And there was litigation going on um, and what was going to come out in discovery. What did they have on certain people? And to me that, yes, it's the money. And yes, it's probably a lot. And, um, you know, everyone will probably get richer. But I feel like there has to be something else, because why would you be that hypocritical? Well, something to remember years ago. I don't know if it was Scott Boros, but years ago, it was this was a theme in multiple collective bargaining situations for baseball. Players just said, show us your books. Mm. And baseball was like, we're not going to show you our books. Yep. I, I think I think the PGA, the live, I think when you go into these discovery, you know, when you get into these lawsuits and you have to show your hand, that makes corporations very nervous. Well, because also we also have seen, you know, forgetting where the money was coming from, the pressure that was put on by Phil Mickelson and company on the PGA tour. I mean, the PGA players all of a sudden making more money. I don't think they didn't. They didn't just come up with more money. That's right. They, they finally started to innovate a little bit and the players are getting their fair share. And when you learn more about some of the PGA players, especially the lesser players who might show up at a tournament, get not make the cut, not get any money. It seemed ludicrous compared to other sports. Not that they should, everyone, you know, deserve six figures every weekend, but you think your hotel and you think you should give a living wage if you're going there and competing. Right. And even if you don't make the cut, that doesn't seem correct. If you're one of the top, I don't know how many, how many people are in a golf tournament, golf tournament every week. Let's say uh, there's a hundred players every week. I don't know the exact number. You know, if you're the top 100 players, you know, give or take in the world, you seem like you should get ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 just for showing up. That would, that would seem to be the, what I would think. And so I do think that they had to change because of that, but that this was just shocking. And the TV aspect of it, um, you know, we still don't know the particulars about how this is all going to work. Um, you know, in terms of when we're talking, this is all going to come out further, but, and I don't know if Monahan last thing on this, and then we'll, I want to move on, but do you think Monahan survives? No, I don't. Yeah. I probably say no. It's, it's never been the easiest, uh, Beeman previously yep. was not well liked. Um, it's, it's a tough commissioner's chair. You know, it's, it's strangely easier to deal with 30 billionaire owners than it is millionaire players. Um, it's, it's a hard chair and it has been my entire life. Yeah. I just don't know how these players react or if they somehow make them right, especially the Roy McElroy's, et cetera, who turned down all this money. All right, let's get really delve in deeper into media. Uh, Big news in your neck of the woods, FS1. Uh, my colleague Ryan Glass Spiegel had the story. Shannon Sharp in negotiations to leave uh, the undisputed with Skip Bayless. Um, that's not completed as of yet. Uh, FS1 has not commented, but I will just ask you as we get into this, because this is this is your field. Um, right. Just what's your like when you look at a situation like that where there's a partnerships and you've had partnerships, you worked with Jason Whitlock, you've worked with Michelle Beadle, you've worked with some big personalities. Um, just what's your take on in terms of what goes on and when, when and what's your reaction to Shannon? Let's just go on. You know, I, I do believe this will it's, it's going to come to fruition um, as well. Uh, what's your take on the situation? Well, tandems and often the more popular they are all have an expiration date. You know, in New York, Mike and the Mad Dog. The bigger you are, the more highly compensated you are. They can be territorial. Now, I don't know the Shannon Skip dynamic other than what I've read. They're right next to me, got along fine. Um, look, at Shannon's a star. And I think in the opinion space, there's maybe five, maybe six people that can migrate an audience. And so I think Shannon's probably one of those. Um, Wherever he surfaces, he's going to do really well. It doesn't matter. I had an agent, Nick Khan. He was a star. He went to WWE. Shocker. He was a star. Michael Rubin creates a company, sells for billions to like eBay. And then he starts Fanatics. 
worth billions. Peyton Manning, Indy, Denver, it works. Like, stars work wherever they go. So Shannon's going to work. Um, I'm not in their production meetings. I stay as far away from management as I can with negotiations. Mine have been thank thankfully very quick, very brief, very friendly. But I think tandems are hard. And I think, um, you know, I, 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 it, it, I mean, there was Stephen A. and Kellerman and Mike and the Mad Dog, Shannon Skip. I think they have an expiration date. Um, but there's not a lot of Shannons in the opinion space. There's a lot of people doing it. Um, there's not a lot of people doing it at a high level and Shannon's theatrical and he's funny and he's handsome and he's uh, quick on his feet and he's got strident, strong opinions and he cuts through. So I, you know, I think he's going to, I think he's going to flourish wherever he goes. So, and let's talk about the other guy. Skip is 71 years old. Um, and, he gets crushed by the internet. Uh, media critics like to crush him. I did a long time ago uh, when first take uh, became first take when it was first cold pizza. I wrote uh, that they, they're cutting his time in half. And I said, they just have to work on the other half. Now, all that said, <laughs> all that said, um, I have some respect for Skip because what you're talking about is a skill. It's a skill. You, you've you said this before. You're in the attention business. And Skip Bayless gets attention. Now, I don't agree with when he talks about LeBron, you know, like he acts, I don't know, like if this thing is LeBron's not good, but he's in the attention business. Um, and th like you said, there's not, people don't realize, like everyone kind of feels like I could talk sports. I could do that job. And anybody could do the job. Doing the job well is not something anybody could do because it's harder to be entertaining uh, for an extended period of time or at least get people's attention for an extended period of time. In my opinion, Skip does that. When you look at Skip Bayless and his career, what do you see? Well, he's a very unique person. He's um, probably the most private person um, I've ever worked with. Um, he absolutely believes in what he's saying, from what I can tell. He loves not only debating, he takes great pride in winning the debate. Yep. Um, I tend to like the search for theories. That's my kind of, I'm not a debate guy. Um, it's just not my personality to debate. Um, he, it's, he, was, he was born to do it. He loves what he does. I mean, he is up at two in the morning. He's on the treadmill. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've found through the years in the media, I just respect people who, who are passionate about what they do. I mean, you really like to break stories. I can tell. It really is a point of pride. Um, John Sterling loves Broadway show tunes, old movies, and doing Yankee games. Um, he loves it. And I didn't get, when I first heard John Sterling, I didn't even get it. I'm like, this is the Yankees. And then it's like, I've come to appreciate um, a passion. You just can't, you know, I think about age a lot more now because I'm in my late fifties and it's, it's, it's really healthy. When I find these people that live to be 80 and they do what we do, they almost all have one thing in common and they don't always have the healthiest lifestyle there. You know, it doesn't matter if it's theater, music, arts, they are so deeply embedded viscerally in what it is. Sterling wakes up thinking about the Yankees, goes to bed thinking about the Yankees. And I think Skip's like that with sports. He loves winning. I mean, he, I, he if you told me he goes home and keeps a, a standings on the arguments he wins, I would believe it. Yeah, I think he and Shannon did. I think they think he loves uh, diet, not Sprite. What's the, what's the other one? Uh, whatever Mountain it is. Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew, that's what it is. I think they bet on each debate or or maybe they bet on the NFL or something and they have a little side bet they did at least until now it's going to end. Um and uh yeah, so I, he yeah, he and he also claims he's never lost the debate. Um yeah. which is of course debatable. You left ESPN basically when yeah. Skip did uh to start FS1 uh and I wanted to go back a little bit to the, to that time. And just first off, why did you make that decision? Well, I remember where I was uh, nine months before I left. I was with my uh, wife, Anne. I remember what she was wearing. We were in Connecticut. She was wearing this kind of meshy blue top. 
glass of red wine. She has beautiful auburn hair. Snow was up to the window and we were going to go out uh, for dinner. And uh, she had said to me, um, you know, we were talking about things and, and we weren't from Connecticut, although we both really miss, we go back to Rhode Island every summer. We miss the Northeast. I miss the tradition and the people and it's really American history is there. And, but I remember we sat down, it was, it was like January. And um, she said, you're just not um, as energized as when I met you years ago. And it was really one of those kind of get busy living or get busy dying moments. And so that night I just said, I think I did it here. I, it's a big brand. It's a monster. It's a, it's a factory. And I'm just kind of, I want to do something else. I want to be part. I want to be, if I'm going to do this, I'd rather be sort of a Chris Berman where I feel like I'm on the, the, the front of something or, or can help kind of build something. So that night in that January, we went on like realtor.com and started booking appointments Five days later on a plane, looking at schools. So it it was a process that I'd been there a decade. Uh, I had good relationships. I really liked it. But it's it's a factory. It's a gigantic company. Fox is not, and that they've gotten smaller since I've been there because they sold off about 60% of the company. It's more boutique. And I just felt, I feel like I'm on the ground floor. By the way, I start the volume. I like building stuff. I like, I really enjoy that when I came to Fox. You know, I sat down with a list. Jamie Horowitz and I had a list of 15 people like get her, get that person, get that person, get that person. It was like, honestly, it was like fantasy sports. It was building a team. It was the, the construct of building a roster and we were able to accumulate some really talented people. So it wasn't really an anti anything movement. It was, a, I wanted something new. 10 years is a lot to do the ESPN treadmill, the car wash. I enjoyed it. I hopefully don't have any enemies there. I really enjoyed it. They circled back a few years later and came after me. And I said, I really appreciate it, but I'm part of a new family, but it wasn't, it wasn't for any other reason than my wife and I just, and I wanted to move back West. I just, we wanted new adventures. So when they circled back to you, that was to do what you're doing and stay in LA. Yeah, they came back. Um, and uh, I told uh, Fox, I said, I'm going to dinner at uh, Beverly Hills, a restaurant called Cut with a former uh, big shot at ESPN. He's in town. He wants to talk. I said, don't take it personally. Um, he's a very good man. Um, I owe him dinner and went to dinner and told him not interested, but I, you know, I was, I'm, I'm always, you know, I may be polarizing to the audience. I'm not with my bosses. I'm up front. I tell them what I think. Um, I don't hide anything. So, um, and I've, you know, they've reached out since um, I'm, I'm in a different place in my life. They've done a great job. I'm at a different place. I'm happy where I am. I've got Eric Shanks has treated me very well. Julie Talbot at Premier has treated me very well. I love the volume. I love my team. They're great. Um, we're really, <laughs> we're pretty low maintenance. We come in, we prep, we have breakfast. I put on makeup. We do the show. We go home. I'm out the door two minutes after the show's done. I don't need anybody to hold my hand. I've been doing this a long time. You've been doing it a long time. You don't need anybody to hold your hand. I take pride in being low maintenance and um, I'm treated very well. And um, I like new adventures. You know, I'm still in my fifties. I'll go with Tra Keller as the executive. Uh, so you, I'm not going to uh, verify your reporting. <laughs> I'll go with Tra Keller. He used to run all of ESPN radio. I'll go with him. National Geographic. Yeah. You spoke to them about a job. What well, would that have so been? I grew yeah, so I grew up with a British mother and uh, my local optometrist dad, and my dad was a reader, and we used to have stacks and stacks of National Geographic, stacks of them. When you grow up as a kid, no internet, no cable TV, rural Washington State, uh, you can only play with the dogs and wiffle ball by yourself so long. So I, I think I read front to back every National Geographic <laughs> for, you know, for the 70s and 80s, and then... um it was when I uh, was thinking I, I at, at that time changed agents at the end of ESPN to Nick Khan. And uh, I got set up by interviewed with Jeff Zucker at CNN. I interviewed with MSNBC. I interviewed with an, uh, a very nice young lady at National Geographic. They were thinking about a travel show. All the stuff was interesting. Jeff Zucker is a really interesting guy, really smart guy. Uh, they had Pierce Morgan and I came in and kind of deconstructed how I would do the show if I did that show. Uh, not that I was going to replace him, but I I just thought the day 
of an interview show was over. I mean, outside of about six guests, you can't do an internet show. I said, if I was doing Pierce's show, it would be like Bill Maher. It would be a 12 minute opening rant. I'd have about four comedy writers. I pitched that by the way to John Skipper, Mm. uh, which was a show at night with comedy writers. They, they offered it, I think to Seth Meyers, I was told, Mm. but that I, that I thought the day of an internet show was over. And I told Zucker that. And, um, and so, you know, it was just, I, I bounced around, but National Geographic, I, I, I remember interviewing and telling the young lady, I'm like, you have no idea how many National Geographics I've read in my life. I think it's why my dad loved, my dad later in life traveled to Russia and Egypt and, and I have the travel bug now. So, you know, part of my life. So, all right, so the, the show would have been a, uh, like you traveling around? Yeah, it would have been, uh. You know, it would have been not Anthony Bourdain, obviously a great chef, but it would, maybe it would have been a little bit of a, a, a 40 year old guy traveling around the country. It was a very exploratory meeting about she's like, what are you interested in? Um, I got set up by an agent and I told and we just kind of it was a really fun conversation in New York City. Um, it may have been the same day I did CNN or the, the, I, I went to New York for about four days and did a bunch of interviews. And it was, you know, I remember leaving the interview thinking, uh, you know, my agent called and I was like, I could do something there. This is, this interests me. Well, passion. Yeah. I have pruned my tree as I've gotten older. I love the NFL. I love college football. I love the NBA playoffs. I love the world cup. And I love a UFC fight, a great card. I like March madness. I like a baseball playoff game, but in my life, I love my wife. I'm into my kids. I love my career. And one of the things that I've I've tried to find a hobby for 10 years. I remember Jim Rome once said he was trying to, his wife said, get a hobby. And he did. It became a business, horses, jungle racing. And uh, I didn't want to start another business, but I, I've really gotten into travel, doing some international travel. And we've got multiple things booked. And it, and, and it just interests me. I, I know what my retirement is going to look like. And it's going to be a lot of hanging out on planes, going to Europe and and trying food and going to Italy. And I know what it's going to look like and I'm ready for it. I'm not there yet. I got another good 10, 12 years doing this, but um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm on the back nine. I've turned the corner. I just got a club sandwich. I got a BLT at the clubhouse and, uh, and a sparkling water. And I'm on the 11th hole. We'll join that PGA live tour. You're making there's going to be big money. There. <laughs> Let me ask you something you did say though, is um when you interview with CNN, does news, how much does that interest you? And is it something you could ever see doing? No, I I've been, um I, when I was in Portland, I had a political um, talk station come after me and I always said, I'm not angry enough to do politics. Um, There's this just cauldron of, of um, anger and, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not territorial on my opinions, Andrew. I have them. I have a rule. I have opinions. You can have an opinion on my opinion. I have no interest having an opinion on your opinion on my opinion. Stuff goes into the ether. I do a show. I can't remember half of my show. I just finished it an hour ago. I I am part entertainer, part sports. Keep it moving. Jason McIntyre, laugh with each other. I like to laugh. It keeps me happy. I, I don't want the agitation of politics. I follow it. I read the New York Times. Uh, I'm on the Wall Street Journal. Um, New York Post. Go ahead. Morning. Yeah. I, I play Wordle. I go to CNN. I'm up at 430. Like I'm into it, but I don't necessarily, I wouldn't want it to be my job. Gotcha. All right. Let's talk about something that is part of your job is the volume, um, which you created how many years ago now? Three years ago? Four years ago? Two. Two. Two years ago. All right. So it's, it's moved fast. Um what, where, how do you look at your business that you have, you know, explain to like, I know a lot about it, but explain to listeners, you know, like if you're giving a synopsis of the, the, uh, the volume of what is it and what you're doing and, and what you're trying to do. Well, I've done a solo thing for a long time. And I always like being part of teams, high school football team, basketball team. I like being part of the Fox team. And so, uh, during COVID, it was about that time that a salesperson came up to me, Julie Talbot came up to me and she said, you know, um, you and Rush Limbaugh are still sold out, despite the fact there's no cars on the road in America during COVID. And I remember hanging up the phone thinking, well, what happens when there's cars on the road? The show had picked up steam. Where do I put the additional ads? I didn't want to do any more radio show. I did three hours. I didn't want to do a four or five hour show. So I said, <clears throat> I'm going to own something. Um, we can have a rev share, but I'm going to give you 2000 more hours a month with iHeart. Um, we'll have a rev share. Um, I'm going to create a podcast network. So um, 
because there were some podcasts, right? Legal things I had to work through. And so we did. And I don't look at it as a podcast company. I'm a broadcaster. I never wanted to be king of the podcast. That was never a big, you know, a big thing for me. Um, but I like being part of it. I like searching for talent. I feel like I, I feel like a baseball scout. Like I'm listening to people, trying to find people. And so it's kind of a digital media company with podcasts. And um, we've got contracts with everybody from Amazon to Bleacher Report to major advertisers. Um, we have a pretty good staff. We're adding to it. We'll, we'll announce a couple of names for the football season. And, um, it's just really, really cool to be part of a team to, to find talent. Um, it's the most fun I've ever had. I, 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 you know, Andrew, if you didn't do this and I said, what would you do if you didn't do this? Maybe you'd say, I want to be a screenwriter or I want to be this. I would want to be a general manager of a football team. And I feel in a weird way, I am. I get final approval. Yep. I listen to a lot of tape. <laughs> I go and I go and uh, you know, try to like free agents, try to find people who are available. We got Richard Sherman last year. We found, you know, Draymond Green was already doing it with the LeBron James company. Uh, we brought him over, gave him full-time editors, little coaching, little marketing. That's exploded. It's really and I don't. Uh, I've had people that have explored buying it. Right now, we're not going to. Um, in 2025, I got 18 months. My contracts run out. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I think the volume will be part of my life for the remainder of my broadcast career. You know, Andrew, when you look at this, how many broadcasters, how many does it end well in the opinion space? Yep, you know, really? It doesn't. You're right. Right. It ends well if you own your own company. Dave Portnoy can control it. Uh, you know, the ringer, Bill Simmons can control it. Um, for guys like me, you usually don't have a final call. So I think my wife said something about a year ago. She said, um, you need to have partners going forward. You don't need to be an employee. You need to have partners. And I like that part of it. I like, I have really good relationships right now. Like for instance, Premier Radio is a partner. We have rev share deals. So I think that that interests me to to be involved with whoever it is. And I'm treated very fairly and very reasonably. Um, I'm really lucky and grateful to have my position. But I think going forward, if you look at the history of opinion makers, political, sports, cultural, you know, big companies move on on their terms. Yeah, you may be the GM, but I feel like your wife might be the owner because each of these big decisions, <laughs> yeah. he kind of has had like the sort of little like. <laughs> You know, yes. kind of smart little thing to kind of push you the right direction because you're kind of like, yes. yeah, maybe should it's like, you know, you should be a partner. Yes. Let me let me tell you something. You have no idea how true that is. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but I think I let me ask you this. Have you got an evaluation? I think I know what it's worth. Um, I've talked to Lion Tree, um, a couple of banks. I do feel very now again, we're in a very soft advertising market. So what your evaluation is can be very fluid, right? I I feel very strongly about what we're worth and am not looking to sell it, but it's a, it's over a hundred million. That sounds pretty good. The markets feels like right now, like you just said, the advertising market is a little bit softer. There seemed as if like, you know, money, the interest rates and all that stuff, again, this is above my head in terms of understanding the stuff, but it seems like it probably is a area right now where you obviously only takes one buyer, but you want to grow a little, you can grow more and then the market will probably change over where people are buying more stuff again. Is that an accurate way to look at it? That is actually incredibly accurate. There's not a lot of buyers on any market right now. Um, uh, you know, I was listening to Barbara Corcoran is a very famous New York realtor. And she was talking about now's the time to buy a home because if you look at the economic data, the jobs report, low unemployment, once inflation comes down, the market's going to explode. There's a lot of money out there. So contrary to some popular opinion, despite the interest rates, now is the time to buy because it's going to heat up in the next six months. And I feel like um, I think everybody's ad revenue is down. It's OK. Um, my my TV shows, I, I feel very lucky. My radio uh, revenue is up 3% year to year, which is considering the economy is knock on wood good. My TV show is up 38% May to May, which with cord cutting doesn't even make sense. Uh, the volume, though, is, an, is new. 
And so, you know, it's more of a fight for us if we're down 15 or 20 percent quarter to quarter. It's more of a fight. But I, I think we're going to be fine. I know we're fine. Um, I I have two big corporations now that uh, control my employment. I don't necessarily need a third. It's really fun to be part of something that you own and you founded. So I'm not, I've made a great living. I'm not, I like the build. I, 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 I mean, I think you could go, I don't want to speak for Dave Portnoy, but I think he got very, very rich selling his company. But I think there are realities and frustrations when you do hand over leverage and power to other people that, you know, there's, it's, there's no perfect world, Andrew, you know, everybody wants to get the bag, but I've done well. I've been always been, a, been investing in the market since 1989. I'm not a big spender. I'm fine. I like helping people. I like the team and I'm in no hurry to sell it. All right. We're, we're getting to the end here. I want to ask you going back to ESPN and you kind of talked about previously about how there's, you know, five or six people who can be talk show host and move the needle. Well, one of those people who's been kind of new uh, and kind of exploded onto the scene is Pat, Pat McAfee, uh, only yeah. 36 years old. Now he moves from being independent, YouTube, going to ESPN in the fall. Um, what was your take on the McAfee deal, which I've reported is uh, five years, 85, around 85 million. That, that around a very important number. So five years, around $85 million. And he's paying his guys with that money. Um, what was your feeling on the McAfee deal with ESPN? Well, I think Jimmy Pitaro, um is doubling down an opinion. You know, when NBC had a cable deal, Andrew, um, I didn't love the construct of it because I didn't think they took the day part seriously enough. And as you know, there's the day part that's not going to get the ratings of night, but it can be the face of your network. Stephen A. Smith matters. Michael and Tony matter to ESPN. I think in the day part, you know, I'm lucky. I think I matter to at Fox Sports, right? We're not going to get the numbers of the night if you have big games. But I didn't think NBC took it seriously. They didn't. They didn't put together a real big, uh, opinionated market. Uh, and maybe because the, a lot of people were taken, in fairness to NBC. But um, I think what Jimmy Pitaro is saying is there are a few voices out there that really matter, and we want them. And I appreciate that. It, it, it'd be very easy to just cut jobs. But what he's saying is we'll pay if it's the right. I mean, Buck and Aikman, uh, Marquee, Monday Night Football. Pat McAfee. So I really appreciate it. I, I, I have, um, you know, years and years ago, I think I've told, I wrote, wrote about this in a book. I, I was at the Union Plaza in Las Vegas. I had just started my career. And um, I was a young salesperson. This is back, Andrew, this is back in like 19, like 90, you know, 30 years ago. Okay. And so there was a big sales meeting. I was kind of a pup and a new employee learning how to sell, but I couldn't go to this meeting. So the guy said, hey, sit at the bar at the Union Plaza. I'll be back in a half hour. So I sat, it was midday. I didn't want to drink. I'm sitting there twiddling my fingers. I don't play video poker. And there was a guy next to me with a Rolex, deep tan, looked like the Marlboro man, open white shirt, looked like, a, looked like an actor. And I'm just a talker. I talk to Uber drivers, taxi drivers. I talk to everybody. So I started talking to him um, and he had just sold uh, like seven or eight Texas, Arkansas radio TV stations. And, uh, and I, you know, I just asked him, I said, would you give me any advice? I said, I want, you know, I'm starting my career. And he said something that's always really, really been important to me. He said, root for people beyond yourself. Root for others to succeed you'll be happy. He goes, I'm part of three or four guys that got really rich. I'm just as happy for them as I am for me. And in our business, I could give you names of people that are backstabbers and there's animosity and they're petty and they're small. I could not be happier for Pat. I, well, he came to Fox one day and we talked about this. He takes big swings. He's a unique personality. Um, I think he has an energy. I mean, I think he lives on Red Bull. Uh, I think he, I think he's actually at best with wrestling. I think he's a rock star with wrestling. 
Um, I, not that he's not good everywhere else, but I just don't, I think miserable people um, root for themselves only. And it doesn't matter if I go up against Pat. Jimmy Fallon goes up against Colbert and Kimmel. They all do fine. They all get paid. I'm fine. I have a big radio audience, big X. You know, Pat and I have different, I'm in the X, I'm serious. I'm in radio. He does wrestling. He does college football. We'll match up there, but we 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 have a lot of separate businesses. We're both going to do great. And I've reached out to him two or three different times. Um, I am happy that ESPN is going doubling down on a big personality. It's it it raises all boats. It's good for all of us. Yeah, I I tend to agree. I think that's very good advice in writing, in TV, in radio, anywhere I've been. I've seen exactly what you're talking about, and sometimes. It's been the bigger the person, the smaller they are in terms of so concerned about everyone else. And I and like they don't seem happy. Like a lot of times, you know, people and I'm not going to name who they are, but like who don't seem happy because they're so worried about, you know, defending their turf or making sure this person doesn't succeed instead of like looking around and being like, I'm in sports, I'm covering sports or I'm talking about sports question. And this is kind of a, a lucky thing. Uh, to be doing. Uh, and so I appreciate it. Well, we're, listen, we are very lucky to have you join us this week. Uh, John is going to be Wally Pipped. Uh, Colin, I don't think we can afford you. Um, but uh, if you want to come back next week, you can. Uh, but we know, sincerely appreciate, you know, co host Big Get. Uh, this is the first time John's been off. His daughter's graduating from high school. So congratulations to her, but really appreciate it, Colin. Well, and also your audience should know this is that there's a lot of people that are in the radio media space and you are the only piece person who regularly calls and asks questions. And you don't do it a lot, a couple times a year, but I have always appreciated you treat it like a beat. You treat it like a, your baseball beat. And I know in my industry, I appreciate that. There's other guys and women that are very, very good. Um, you know, there's a bunch. I live out in LA, the variety, the deadline, like it's a beat. And you treat it like that, and the post is lucky, and so is your audience. I appreciate that very much. Um, with that, we're going to bid you adieu, and, and thank you so much again for joining us. As always, want to thank AC Wyatt, who puts it all together, Chris Mason, the master of the board. John is back next week uh, for a full Marshan and Oran Sports Media podcast. Uh, thanks for listening. If you like, subscribe, say something nice in the comments. It's appreciated. If not, just enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.